The title is Beyond Ms. Magazine, Feminist Pedagogy in the Online Classroom. And it's really uh, quite auspicious, I think, that this is happening on International Women's Day. Uh, this talk was organized several months ago, I think, and Rob simply offered the date. And it just so happened uh, that it is going on when there is a uh, worldwide day celebrating uh, the contributions of women. So I think that's quite auspicious. Um, so I'm going to talk today about feminist pedagogy, particularly in the online classroom. And I'm going to approach this in such a way to um, really, I hope, address uh, the interests and concerns of a wide uh, range of, of the participants who might be here with us today. I know we might have people from the public, other educators, students, and staff here at CSU Global. So let's start. I hope uh, if, if you're going to come along this journey with me uh, exploring feminist pedagogy, I think it behooves us to have a conversation and some basic shared understanding oops, about feminism and about pedagogy. My, my slides here are kind of uh, are having a mind of their own this morning. So I think a lot of people, when they think of feminism, they think of, first of all, Gloria Steinem, one of the most uh, prominent feminists, I think, of our time, who's still very active in her career and research and publications, I think at age 81 um, is where she is right now. So that's quite amazing. So a lot of people think of Gloria Steinem. Another thing I think that people think about are protests, right? Particularly recently, there were the women's marches on Washington during the inauguration or during the week of the inauguration. So people think of groups of women that are protesting. Um, here are a couple more images of feminists that may be familiar to some of you. We have here Coretta Scott King in the bottom left of the corner here, of course, certainly very active in the civil rights movement, um, but was also uh, for, for African Americans, but also very active in working for rights for women. And then of course, we have the amazing uh, Dr. Maya Angelou in the bottom right, an amazing poet, and also a speaker and writer on rights for women. So these are, I think, some of the common ideas that, that people have um, about feminism. However, I think it's important to acknowledge that there are other non-competing, but less perhaps publicized views of feminism and feminists that I think are worth uh, acknowledging. So here are some more pictures and images of feminists. Here we have Justin Trudeau, Prime Minister of Canada. Uh, Barack Obama, the former president of the United States. Up here in the top right, we have Winona LaDuke, who has done a lot of activism for women's rights, but also for Native American rights. Here in the bottom corner, we have someone who is Muslim, identifying as feminist, as a feminist. Uh, here we have a picture of Susan B. Anthony. Of course, here's my slideshow, having a mind of its own this morning. Uh, Susan B. Anthony, who, of course, is an early feminist. And then here we have a logo of an organization from uh, Feminists for Life, which is actually a feminist organization that is pro-life. So though the other images of feminists might have been more familiar, I think it's also important to acknowledge that feminists come in many different genders, different ethnicities, different uh, religions, and that, that feminists don't all agree on everything either. Certainly, uh, there are many, many feminists who would disagree with um, members of this organization, Feminists for Life, and vice versa. So there's certainly uh, room for everyone <laughs> amid feminism. Okay, so moving forward. I think it's important to um, address some, some, some common misconceptions about feminism. Um, and later, if, if we have some time for questions, and I hope we do, 
Um, I would love to hear any others that some of you have heard or have experienced and, and how we might uh, address those. So a very common one right away is that feminists hate men. Um, certainly this, this is not true. <laughs> um, uh, many feminists have men in their lives who they love immensely, husbands, siblings, children, friends, etc. Feminism is not about um, bringing down another gender, and it is not about uh, oppressing any group of people, uh, regardless of their sight of, of uh, commonality or difference, okay? So feminism is really about um, uplifting women and fighting for equal rights and not about uh, subjugation or oppression. So the first one, absolutely not true. Feminists do not hate men. And <laughs> here we go. Um, femin another common misconception is feminism, Feminists are po always politically liberal. This might be a trend, but it is absolutely not true. There are politically conservative feminists. Indeed, there are Republicans that identify as feminists. So that is not true. Feminists are pro-choice. Certainly that could easily be a trend, but as I pointed out on the prior slide, there are pro-life feminists. Um, one of their arguments is that the, the early feminists, such as Susan B. Anthony, who was on that earlier slide, was pro-life. And they make other arguments um, along the lines of the, the fact that, you know, they believe that many women engage in abortion because they don't have choices. So um, there's some interesting arguments and diversity in that viewpoint, even among feminists, okay? Feminism is only about women. That's another common uh, misconception. Um, I could talk about this one for some time, uh, but first of all, I, I hope that we could all agree that having equal rights for women doesn't just benefit women. Uh, it benefits children, it benefits families. Uh, it really benefits everyone. When, when humans have equal rights, um, everyone benefits from that. The other thing to keep in mind is that um, many of the civil rights movements and women's rights movements have found a lot of commonality. And so I think uh, particularly now with some of the, the, the more recent sites of difference um, that have been historically disenfranchised that uh, are now coming more into the light regarding um, sexuality rights, gay marriage, uh, transgender rights, et cetera. There's a lot about feminism that can also be applied to those struggles as well. Because feminism, yes, it's about equal rights for women, but ultimately it's about equal rights for human beings. So there's a lot about feminism that can be applied to um, other struggles for civil rights. Another uh, misconception is that feminism is all or nothing. So, uh, <laughs> You're either, you know, a feminist or you don't believe in women's rights. And I, I apologize for the sirens. Uh, I live in a busy part of town. This isn't true. Um, you can not identify as feminists and, and believe that women should have equal rights. Um, you can identify as feminism, as, as a feminist, and still maybe not agree with everything that maybe predominant feminism um, works to uphold. So it's not an all or nothing thing. Um, in a similar way, you might say that, you know, even among a political party, if you're a Democrat, you might not agree with everything the, the, the party does and vice versa. So it's not an all or nothing thing. You don't have to completely uh, commit to the cause to realize that um, there might be aspects of, of feminism with which you agree. And then finally, uh, another misconception, um, and I don't like using the word myth, <laughs> because as a literary professor, um, I don't associate myth with, with untruth. Um, so I'll, I'll, use, I'll continue to use the word misconception. Uh, feminism is not about taking power from other groups. Okay, feminists do not want to replace patriarchy with matriarchy. Okay, they don't want <laughs> to just now have women in charge. It's really about having 
equal rights for women and not about continuing any cycle of oppression or disenfranchisement. Okay, so moving along, I, I hope we can have a common understanding about feminism, about what feminism uh, is not, and then we can move forward to talking about a bit, a bit more about what it is. So obviously the focus of my talk today is feminist pedagogy. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about this. I was talking with a friend recently and she said, you know, what are you working on? A friend who doesn't work in academia. And I said, oh, I'm, I'm working on this presentation about feminist pedagogy. And she said, what is that? So I think uh, I wanted to kind of take a step back and make sure there's a common understanding about really what feminist pedagogy is. So feminism, as I've, as I've stated, is a belief or ideology that, centers, that centers its focus on obtaining equal rights for women. And I think as I've already stated, this is a, a extremely broad category. There is a lot of diversity within feminism, uh, just as there are, there's a lot of diversity within other belief systems, but all feminists would agree with, with that, okay? Pedagogy is the practice of teaching. So feminist pedagogy is an approach to teaching informed by feminist theory. It's not about um, being an activist in the classroom overtly. <laughs> um, and it's not about getting your, you, you know, one student's going to protest. It's the approach to teaching that um, aligns itself with some feminist uh, pedagogical principles. And it's not exclusive to any particular field of study. One can approach teaching math with feminist pedagogy or physics or literature or really any subject. Um, so, and I'm gonna get to some classroom things in just a minute. Um, it's fun for me to really uh, find some quotes and some, some inspiration from some uh, well-reputed um, feminist thinkers. So this first one is from Bell Hooks um, and I, that is intentionally lowercase, that is her pseudonym, and that is how she prefers it. Uh, that is not a typo. Um, and she is really the one that I would recommend if anyone wants to read more after this presentation. She's the first place I would send you. Clearly my PowerPoint has a mind of its own. So she says, the classroom with all its limitations remains a location of possibility. In that field of possibility, we have the opportunity to labor for freedom, to demand of ourselves and our comrades an openness of mind and heart that allows us to face reality even as we collectively imagine ways to move beyond boundaries, to transgress. This is education as the practice of freedom. And I hope that all of us as various stakeholders in the um, field of education, whether we're staff, whether we're faculty, students, whether we're a member of the public um, and our, and our um, part of our um, tax dollars actually go towards education. Um, I hope that we would all agree that this is a very powerful statement and a really important one, that really it is through education that um, possibility arrives. And uh, I think education in the classroom in particular is a very democratizing environment. And later on, I'll speak about this a bit more, but how I feel online education in, in particular is even more democratizing um, because it makes it accessible to people who may have not had access prior. So bell hooks, so that idea of accessibility and, and the potential in education, we'll see here in just a minute when I go through some of the fundamental uh, tenets of feminist pedagogy. So this next quote uh, is from one of my former professors uh, in my last year of graduate school at the University of California, Davis. Um, this is Amina Mama, who is a world-renowned feminist, uh, it's taught at Oxford, um, has, I, I believe, addressed several African presidents. I mean, she, she's very well reputed, and I was lucky to have her as my professor in a very small class. Um, and, and she said one time, and this was in a response to a research project I was doing because I was exploring uh, 
kind of the diversity or lack thereof of literary texts in the curriculum at the university. And she and I both agreed that it's very important to include um, diversity in the curriculum. Um, and she said, you know, a lot of places focus on diversity in a very demographic way, right? They look at um, age, they look at gender, they look at sexuality, they look at race, they look at disability, status, etc. All of that is important, but we can't stop there. And uh, she said this, and it stuck with me. What's the point of diversity if everyone thinks the same? So I, and I kind of remember that, I, I re tend to recall that too, whenever sometimes um, I hear uh, people get frustrated with uh, disagreement, political disagreement. And we have to remember that disagreement is really the mark of a healthy democracy. Um, and that's true diversity, diversity of idea. Um, so I think this is a really strong statement that comes from a very strong woman. And finally, one of my favorites, uh, Dame Rebecca West, British writer, said, I myself have never been able to find out precisely what feminism is. I only know that people call me a feminist whenever I express sentiments that differentiate me from a doormat. And, uh, you know, I, I um, shared with, with some friends today, and I've had this conversation at times with other colleagues um, about, you know, Women's Day or Black History Month or, or things like that. And uh, sometimes you will hear someone say, well, why do we need a Black History Month or why do we need a Women's Day? And I like to say, well, the fact that we're still asking those questions means we still, we still need to um, address those issues and that there's more work to be done. So speaking of more work to be done, my work is in the classroom. And so let's talk about how um, feminist pedagogy can be applied in the online classroom. So in doing my reading, and obviously one can read for years, and people do <laughs> on this subject, I really found kind of three general areas, three kind of categories that um, scholars of feminist pedagogy speak to in their research, okay? And as I go through these, you'll see that all of these areas really do interconnect as, as they should in the classroom. So the first one has to do with the space. So, um, you know, most of the research is on the on-ground classroom just because Historically, that's where most of learning has happened. There is more research now coming out about um, pedagogical explorations of, of feminism in the online classroom. So I'll kind of do some discussion about how they can intersect. So let's just think about the space of a classroom. Uh, a classroom environment influenced by feminist pedagogy seeks to democratize and decentralize the locus of power. Okay, so, so though the environment must still be directed by the educator, there's a conscious awareness of possible bias between uh, teacher and student and between students themselves. So we think historically of the university, of the classroom. You know, you have a, a teacher at the podium kind of imparting knowledge <laughs> to uh, this room of um, intellectually hungry students. And it's really always the teacher that has all of the authority and power. So some argue, some feminists argue, that the online classroom really repeats that because the students are really just kind of really at the mercy of the instructor to show up and respond. Um, and they there's a lot of waiting for responses. Um, to feedback, responses to emails, responses to discussion boards, etc. So there is that point. I would argue that there's a stronger case to be made for the opposite. First of all, um, the, the online classroom just in and of itself, I think democratizes the structure of power. No longer um, does someone have to have, first of all, the power of money 
to own a car, to drive and get to um, a university to take class. So I have students in rural areas. Some students have disabilities that might have a, a physical disability from getting to class. Other students could have a, an illness um, that prevents them from getting to class. One could then make the argument, well, they still need internet access. One can get a library card, use internet very often at a library for free. So I think just in the approach to education, the online classroom environment already really lends itself well to an application of feminist pedagogy because it is really founded upon the idea that education should be more accessible. So I think that is very helpful. I mean, no longer does education only privilege people that don't have full-time jobs, that are physically able to get to class, et cetera. I think we all are familiar with some of the um, life circumstances of online students. Um, so moving forward, so that's one kind of decentralizing locus of power. Um, another thing has to do with students being called upon. So the second point here, um, there's uh, the idea that, you know, we want to eliminate bias in the classroom, okay? We don't want to eliminate difference. We want to eliminate bias. <laughs> so um, there's a lot of research that shows in on-ground on classrooms, men are called upon more frequently by instructors of various races and various genders, alluding to the fact that a lot of us have really um, internalized the um, patriarchal structures with which we are confronted from, I mean, essentially from birth growing up. So the fact that in the on, in the on ground, excuse me, in the online classroom, um, we as instructors, especially at CSU Global, we are required to respond to every student. And a student does not have to have his or her hand raised and wait for me to respond and hope that I ha we have enough time in class to hear this gem of knowledge that the student wants to share. The student doesn't have to wait for me. The student can simply post in the discussion forum and be heard. So in that sense, that actually very much aligns with feminist, uh, feminist pedagogical principle and the fact that the student is not dependent on me to be heard. The student can make him or herself heard. Moreover, students can still retain that, that individuality. So um, even though perhaps I'm not, you know, I'm not uh, expressing as much bias by perhaps being required to, to respond to all students and perhaps differences in gender might not be so uh, so visually obvious to me that might make me less likely to to call on um, male students more frequently because there's a bit more anonymity in the classroom so one challenge we would have here is then to how to allow for that diversity. So at, at CSU Global in the Schoology platform, um, students do have the option of creating a picture. We do have a, an introductory forum. So in that way, students can still retain their individual identity in an online environment that can sometimes be um, a bit homogenous. So we definitely would want to steer away from any types of practices that would lead towards homogeneity. Um, a final point here, displacement of power uh, can also occur between students um, and online instructors should be mindful of this. So even though we want to kind of, uh, kind of disperse the, the locus of power from only being in the instructor to a more democratic environment, of course, ultimately the instructor is responsible for the space. Ultimately, the instructor does have a certain amount of authority in the classroom. And so this can, this kind of democratized environment where students can just say something and it's out there in the classroom immediately, um, and they're not physically in the room with 25 other people. Um, sometimes, and I'm sure some of us can see a similar trend on social media, people 
just say things. So it's important for the instructor to be mindful of that and to also um, attend to those interactions between students in order to make sure that there's not um, an inappropriate um, power structure going on in between students where, where one student is perhaps being a bit abrasive with another. So one way that an instructor could possibly mitigate those problems is to have a guide for peer responses. So instead of just saying respond to a student, actually give points uh, that the instructor would like to see that student address in peer responses so that the discussion really focuses on learning and not on um, just gut reactions, so to speak. My point here, well, this is very important. One student's desire to be heard in a particular way should not overshadow the right of, of the whole class to have that safe, productive learning environment. All right, so that's point on space. Um, oh, finally, one more point here. Um, an, another idea that relates to feminist pedagogy is to kind of get rid of the idea that all knowledge resides in the instructor. So another way to, to decentralize that um, in an on-ground classroom might be to call on a guest speaker. Um, in an online environment, share a video of another scholar talking on the subject, share a website, share a link to additional resources. This also relates to some of the other points in that it really starts to empower the student. When the student sees another person talking about a subject, sees great information from a professor at Yale that's posted on YouTube or other resources from other universities, that shows the student you are not dependent on me for your education. And you can actually continue to educate yourself outside of this classroom long after the class is over. So next, uh, related to that point, knowledge. Feminist pedagogy allows for personal experience to be considered a type of knowledge more so than in the traditional environment. Um, this is because historically certain groups of people have had more access to education, knowledge, publication, etc. So although we at the college level don't want to have, um, we still want to encourage critical thinking, let me say that, historically, not everyone has had access to education. Not everyone, so thus not everyone, uh, every group has been represented in our history of publications. So uh, there's a lot of catching up to do. And because of that problem, because there's that disparity in perhaps the representation in our, in our literary history, but not only in, in literature and scientific everything, it's important to allow for other types of knowledge to be validated in the classroom. So that personal experience that is considered also a type of knowledge in the world of feminist pedagogy. So there can be a contradiction here, and this is something that, that I often experience as a, a professor of literature. So um, we want to validate the student experience or the personal experience, but also encourage critical thinking and media literacy. How do we do that? <laughs> um, so one very uh, practical application of this that I'll share is um, a student wanted to, uh, I'm gonna ch I change some information uh, just so to, to protect the identity of the student, but a student wanted to write a paper on skin cancer. And um, the student wanted to write it, a research paper on skin cancer from personal experience. And the student said, well, I know a lot about it because I've had skin cancer and I'm a nurse practitioner. Well, that's great that you're interested in this subject and it's important to research it. However, that doesn't mean you're an expert on it. Um, you know, an expert on it would be someone who has published articles on skin cancer in scholarly journals or someone who's well reputed as an expert on it. So then it's like, how do we balance this, the different types of knowledge? We, I want to, in, encourage 
as a, as a feminist um, instructor to encourage this personal knowledge, personal experience, but we, I also need to make sure that the student realizes that he or she is not an expert and that it's important to find scientifically validated information on certain points. So I might kind of marry the two or find a happy medium by allowing students to choose their own topics and then guiding them towards the research or allow for a certain part of the paper to be explored using a personal um, approach. Um, student responses, I think in general, tend to be reactionary, especially in classroom of literature, which is where I most often find myself these days. So I think one way to encourage the critical thinking while allowing for that personal knowledge, again, is to have discussion prompts and assignments that allow for both. So allowing for the student to share a personal connection with the work, but then remembering the outcomes or goals of the course, and then maybe asking that student to explore it um, and referring to particular literary elements that were discussed that week, an application of a particular theory or what have you, so that we we're still maintaining rigor um, in the course and encouraging critical thinking and uh, media literate, literacy, excuse me. Um, and, and as this relates to space, as I've already discussed, this really goes against that traditional model of, you know, let me pour my knowledge into your, <laughs> into your head. It really helps, encourages um, an educator to be more of a guide in the student's education. And, and this is a, this is a, an intentional uh, female metaphor here, a feminist pedagogy sees educators as guides in helping students give birth to their own knowledge. And finally, the third point is agency, right? So we've talked about space, we've talked about knowledge, and finally, the final um, kind of primary uh, tenant or category here that relates to feminist pedagogy is agency. And I hope you can see that these are all very much interconnected. Because students are seen as valued participants in their own education, they are afforded a sense of agency in the classroom. This is important as it helps students to see their own value, knowledge, and ability to act outside the classroom, right? They are not dependent on me in the classroom and they are not dependent on anyone outside of the classroom. I think this is such an important part of our role as uh, educators. There are a lot of challenges here, especially in the online environment. Um, here's a problem. Some students pick up on this differently and some need more time. That can be an issue in an on-ground classroom, or excuse me, an online classroom where classes are often shorter. Some online classes are only five weeks long. Here at CSU Global, they are eight weeks long. Eight is better than five, but it's still half the length of a normal semester class. So we just do not have that time to really kind of foster and, and observe the growth we might in an on-ground classroom. Therefore, it's so important for online instructors to be present in that course and to be on top of their emails, on top of discussion posts, because there is that sense of immediacy in the online environment. So that's a very important um, application of feminist pedagogy to help students see that agency. We, in, in a short time, we need to really make sure we're there. Um, another challenge of that agency in the online environment is that students really, it's really more on them to take the initiative to reach out for help. In an on-ground classroom, I can see a furrowed brow. Um, I can pull a student aside after class and say, do you want to stop by office hours? I can go through, let's go through your paper feedback and talk about the next one. There's that human connection. Um, distance education should not be distant. However, because we don't have that, you know, two or three time a week personal connection, students very often do feel distant and alone. So it's very important to 
um, for the online instructor in, in accordance uh, with imparting agency on their students, helping them give birth, applying feminist pedagogical principles, to remind students of the resources available to them while leaving the ultimate um, taking action to the students. So we want to empower them, but we don't want to do the work for them because doing, and when I say do the work for them, you know, giving too much away. So um, I always share, you know, students about, share with students tutoring services available, writing, office hours, library. I do video chats. I have done video announcements. I have done phone conversations. Um, and I have actually had a couple of students say, I requested a phone meeting with you after you posted your um, video announcement because I, you know, <laughs> it helped them see that I was a real person that cared about them. Um, and I always say, I love, you know, I'm happy to schedule phone meetings and here's what you need to do. So there, but it's still up to that student to really email us for the phone meeting or to reach out to the library, reach out to the writing center. So I think the more we can do that, encourage um, that, um, the better. Again, finally, learning should not be confined to the classroom on either part of the instructor or student. All of us have the power to be involved beyond those digital walls, uh, walls involving agency, um, space, and knowledge. So I think kind of the general theme here is that um, I don't know if disintegration is the right word, but a deconstruction and maybe a rearranging of power, space, and knowledge, and, and using kind of principles of feminism to empower students and realize that they actually have the tools they need to further their own education and where they're kind of um, helping them along. All right, so that's what I have. And um, I'm curious if there are any, these are just some questions for discussion that I thought would be interesting, but you, anyone is welcome to ignore them or add their own, add comments. Um, but that is what I had today on International Women's Day. All right, that was really very, very informative. And I certainly learned a lot uh, from the uh, from your presentation. So thank you for that. Uh, I was just wondering, I mean, I have a number of questions here. Uh, one of them was, uh, is, you know, I was thinking, you know, what, um, would there be any uh, 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 advantage you think to just completely shield in an online environment, just completely shielding the person's names? In other words, they become student one to student 25 in the classroom. Uh, and so all the instructor knows is that that's student two, that's student three. Now, now I know that there would have to be some things like, you know, maybe not an introductory, um, you know, post or, you know, maybe, you know, you know, there might be some difficulty with personal emails, you know, where you would identify yourself as a male or a female. <laughs> But I was just, you know, wondering if we see, if we have this bias, what, what, the, what the possible advantage might be to, uh, to having like, you know, a gender neutral um, uh, uh, student, you know, because that can be done online where you can't really do that in, in, on ground. You know, the, the second thing I was thinking, you know, from a bias standpoint, you know, from a racial bias standpoint is people, is student photos too. You know, student photos, some, some of, you know, like uh, African-American woman, uh, you know, photo that you see, or maybe, you know, um, you know, what's your thought of like, you know, posting a student, student photos? Well, this, it's a two-part question. The first one is, you know, can we make a, the online class, classroom gender neutral? And is that, is that negative or positive? And then the second thing that, that was, you know, the use of, photos for the person's individual identification in the online classroom. So uh, two different ones, but I, I just two things that came to mind off the top of my head here. These are great questions, Rob. Um, you and I might need to talk about this in another time. So we have more than more than 15 or 20 minutes. 
Um, these are questions that I've asked myself. I think here's the thing, and, and I've, I've thought about doing research projects with this. Um, first of all, I'm going to give you a long answer to the question. So you're just going to have to <laughs> deal with that. First of all, um, I've thought about just personally doing a research project where the instructor's gender is neutralized. Um, because I think it would be, be an interesting exploration um, to see how students might treat uh, me differently if my gender is neutral or in the, you know, do neutral gender. Clearly, if I use my name and picture, I'm female or then to maybe have a, uh, a male gendered instructor, but have it still be me. I think that would be an interesting research project um, because there are there are clear um, differences, you know, I mean, just in, in, in anecdotally that I've discussed with my male and female colleagues at many universities and our, exper our classroom experiences, whether it be online or on ground, do show trends and the trends are, are quite different. Um, I think your question about gender neutrality is really interesting. I think it would be a really interesting experimentation for a research project, but I don't think um, as far as feminist pedagogical principles go, I don't believe it would align with that because we don't want to erase difference. We want to equalize opportunity while celebrating and honoring difference. Sometimes to train someone, I think, who maybe has inherent bias um, or to make aware, one aware of inherent bias, I think what you're talking about can be very helpful. I just don't think it should be a matter of practice. Um, but I think it's a very important point. I mean, your, your point raises the fact that, I mean, I'm sure you're aware and I'm aware, we all have bias whether we, we like it or not, we just, we just do. Um, and the student photos, again, for the same reason. I, I think students should be allowed the option, and a lot of them do, they don't post pictures of themselves, they post pictures of their animals. Um, heck, I, I used to post pictures of, of my dog um, as my profile picture with myself and my dog. But, so I think there are ways to, um, Get around that one if a student isn't comfortable posting a posting a photo but again to, to the same point um we want to honor honor the the various human experiences um and not and not erase them uh so i think i think it would be an interesting research project but again um either of those to um to perhaps do a couple experimental classrooms and, and do some comparative analysis that way. But um, I would be very uh, hesitant to, um, to think that that would be a, a good um, way to move forward. Yeah, it, Elizabeth, it reminds me of um, what they had to do for selection of orchestras. Uh, what they do now is they actually shield the players behind screens. And so a person comes in, say, you know, they're trying out for a part in, say, the Chicago Symphony or whatever. You don't know the gender of the person. You don't, you just, all the people on the other side of the screen are doing is listening to the player and to see uh, if that's the type of sound that they want. And then they hire that person. That person could be a, a Martian, uh, you know, playing that instrument. And so the, but... But the thing is, is that, you know, I guess you could say that playing an instrument is not necessary. I guess that's a one particular skill that should not, certainly should not have a gender um, criteria with it. But, but I think the point that you make about, you know, that, you know, different, you know, diversity of opinions in the classroom, you know, uh, from gender as well as you know, race and, and is, is actually beneficial to the classroom, which we don't want to eliminate those differences. You know, we want to celebrate those differences and be able to, you know, to have the student learn from all the different perspectives, you know what I mean? Yeah, um, if I may share a story since, since we do have some time. Um, so 
many moons ago, I was teaching at a, a university um, that was an, it was an engineering school. Um, so it, it was predominantly male. Uh, it did attract a predominantly male student body because every, every field was engineering. And it was, it was a school where we were actually required, you know, to take role um, every day. And in, a lot of schools do that now for um, financial aid reasons, but long story short, so I, I just didn't ever really like just reading role. Um, I never really enjoyed that. So instead I would always have students um, introduce one another, you know, pair up, introduce, uh, introduce your partner and share what he, how he or she likes to be called. And um, there was a student who told me later that, um, and I'm gonna try to not give away <laughs> um, anything, but the student was a transgender student. And the student said, um, I really appreciate that you did that because how I like to be called is very different from the name that's on your roster. Okay, and then the name that was on my roster um, was gave away, it was a very gendered name, let's say. So um, that really brought that to my attention. And uh, I ended up sharing this funny story with this student. Uh, there is a transgender professor at Stanford in, I forget which field, it's in the sciences. Um, and this is someone who transitioned from female to male and was pursuing a career in academia from um, uh, while this transition was going on. But it's funny, there's actually records of people <laughs> saying, oh, don't you love so-and-so's research? Yeah, but did you see that stuff his sister wrote? And it was <laughs> like night and day um, response. It was the same person. It just, some of it was published under, you know, or conference papers were given under a male name as a man and others as under a female name as a woman and if that doesn't share you know the inerrant bias uh that we have i don't know what does um so <laughs> so i would say you know one um some of us i think uh are hesitant to call ourselves feminists. Um, but, you know, as I said earlier, one doesn't, you don't have to call yourself feminist to think that um, women should have equal rights in the classroom or, or, or to even, excuse me, even agree with some of the principles that, that I've discussed. I don't, you know, I like to think that there might be uh, some, some accidental feminists out there. <laughs> yeah, no, Elizabeth, great. I mean, excellent points. I mean, um, you know, you mentioned earlier, I think, about the, the um, you know, the fact that there are feminists uh, of every single political persuasion. And, um, you know, I think there's actually a practical, no matter what political persuasion you are, there's a practical um, reason why we would want to have uh, equality across uh, sexes as well as uh, races. Uh, and, uh, it's an article that I really enjoy. It was, it's by Ralph Peters. It was published in 1998 and it's called uh, Seven Signs of Non-Competitive States. And I just want to quote one of, one of his points. He says, uh, any country or culture that suppresses half of its population, he's talking about women, excluding them from economic contribution and wasting energy keeping them out of the school and workplace is not going to perform competitively. Um, when talent enters a workforce, it creates jobs, competition, improves performance. So the point that is made, you know, is that, you know, there's an economic talent uh, as well, uh, just uh, and, and, and overall uh, benefit to society of having uh, equality uh, that's beyond, uh, it's an economic argument you know, and, and one that everybody should agree to. I mean, who wants to, to, to suppress talent? You know what I mean? So, I mean, you know, it's it, that kind of argument, you know what I mean? Where, why would you want, why would you want to keep out talent? Why would you want to suppress talented people? 
Absolutely. And I think the, the economic piece should not be understated. So I'm glad you brought that up. There's a common number that's thrown out, you know, like women make, I think, you know, 70 or 75 cents on the dollar compared to a man. But what a lot of people don't acknowledge that they're talking about white women. For women of color, it's even less. So, um, and that's why, you know, feminism does not just align with women. Um, I mean, it's really about equal rights for humans. And I mean, even among feminist groups, there are a lot of feminists of color who disagree with some of the, you know, predominant um, things about feminism that are said in the media because that. I think it's 70 or 75 cent numbers thrown out all the time. And they're like, what about me? I make 50 cents. I have to, <laughs> I have to work twice as long as a man does for the same amount of money. So um, it's that diversity piece cannot be understated. And so um, diversity, not just of race, but of sexuality, of gender, um, and all other sites of difference, disability, ability, et cetera. So... Yeah, thanks for the discussion. Um, I'm not sure if Trace has any um, uh, comment here. Um, I've got like a ton of questions. <laughs> uh, what, Elizabeth, what do you think, um, I mean, what can we draw from, uh, from Hillary Clinton's um, uh, campaign and, and in your opinion, uh, from, the, from the point of feminism? Because she won the popular vote by 3 million votes so clearly she, you know, the, the, you know, uh, the election was won by a purse by a man who didn't win the popular vote uh, and won through kind of an electoral college, uh, you know, situation. Um, I mean, what, what, what can we draw, I guess, from this election? I mean, obviously we can draw that we still have a lot of long way to go, but what, what's your thoughts as you saw this election unfold and and um you know our first uh you know possibly female president losing you know but <laughs> losing but winning the popular vote so just a question oh man um of course you asked me that when we have five minutes left <laughs> i think the pot let me let me try to spin this in a very positive positive way um it did bring to light, and this is, I don't know if this is positive, it did, it did bring to light how much work we have to do. There was a lot of discussion and analysis in the media about even though she was the presidential candidate, right, she's, she's still getting com comments about what she's wearing, about her pantsuits. And so there would be kind of mocking, um, you know, competing narratives about, well, you know, President Bill Clinton arrived in a gray pinstripe. <laughs> It sounds so silly when it when it's applied to a man, but you know, women are even as a presidential candidate, she's being objectified because a fair you know percentage of the discussion is about her appearance. To your other point about how she kind of won, you know, people say, well, she didn't win the electoral college. She did win the popular vote, and she still didn't get the job. And I, and I know, I, I feel like a lot of other um, feminist colleagues and friends that I have, we'd be like, yep, well, you know, welcome to what it's often like for women that we, we feel sometimes that we, we do have to work twice as hard only to still not, you know, achieve the same thing. Um, so I, I think it's, I guess kind of my final point that I would leave on that relates to our work in the classroom, since that's really the focus. Um, and, you know, I hope that, that this is all still approachable to people, both political parties, because I don't want to, um, don't want to alienate anyone. I, words matter. Words really matter. What we do in the classroom matters. How we view one another matters. And, I, you know, I, I can't, um, I can't understate just even the little decisions we make day to day in the classroom do matter. Uh, you know, I used to teach Spanish at a university that graduated a shooter, 
for that shot at some of the Black Lives Matter protesters. And this is a university that's a very well reputed public, excuse me, private institution. A lot of students come from private high schools and um, we don't, you know, especially in the online classroom, it is very anonymous. And so we can't see someone that's agitated. Um, and socioeconomic um, differences are probably less visible to us. Um, and I've taught at places where I, I've had to have many students come from the inner city. And, um, you know, I don't know where uh, many of my students are. So if anything, I think it reminds us that our work more than ever really matters. Words matter. Um, I, I recently sent an article off about activism in the humanities. And I, I think I ended it saying something like, um, all activism and really everything in life begins with a thought. And that's why it's so important uh, in the classroom that we encourage that critical thinking um, and that uh, deliberate thinking um, and, and diversity as well. Well, that was great. We very much enjoyed that. And, and this, this, uh, this lecture will be uh, taped uh, and then uh, will be available on the, uh, on our internal website to, to view in the future. And I think that definitely, uh, if anybody wants to go back, certainly our instructors want to go back and uh, look at your uh, talk here, I would, we're going to very much encourage that. Uh, and that's one of the advantage, advantages, obviously, of having this permanently archived is that we can get the word out to all of our instructors at CSU Global as they consider this very important uh, topic that you bring up here. So th thanks so much for okay. your uh, presentation today and uh, really enjoyed it a lot. And, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, thank you for everyone who attended live today. Thanks, Rob. Take care. Okay. okay thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.